Thank you all for coming. My name is Michael Keller. I'm the university librarian at this great university. And I am happy that you all came to this celebration of David Harris's remarkable life. In September of 2014, as we celebrated the library's acquisition of the Bob Fitch Photographic Archive in this room, I was honored to welcome David Harris as a member of a panel discussion entitled Voices from the Movements, a conversation with Bob Fitch and veterans of the social movements of the 1960s and the 1970s. That was a great conversation. It was inspiring. These people were imbued with the values of the revolution that brought more civil justice to this country than had been present for a very long time or ever. David's powerful remarks on that day gave us all rich insights into his convictions and his resolve as a leader and activist. David's remarks also demonstrated his eloquence as a speaker, providing powerful words to go along with Bob Fitch's revealing images of him as a leader of the resistance in the Vietnam era. We are similarly honored today to host this celebration of David Harris' life as an activist, proponent of peace and justice, particularly apropos in these days, journalist and author, and to announce the acquisition of his archive by the Department of Special Collections here in the Stanford Libraries. Like the Fitch Archive, David's archive will provide extraordinary will provide researchers, both at Stanford and beyond, an extraordinary window into his life and career. David's life as an activist touched on the many causes he espoused and subjects on which he wrote, from the resistance to the war in Vietnam, to professional football, and on to conservation of the iconic California Redwoods. It joins a host of other similarly rich collections documenting social justice in our time that reside here in the Department of Special Collections, and more are coming. I'm grateful to my colleagues and friends, Ben Stone, Josh Schneider, and our Department of Special Collections under the leadership of Roberto Trujillo. I want you three gentlemen to stand up, please. These Colleagues have worked over the past year with David and his family to bring the archive to Stanford Libraries. And I want to acknowledge also Sonia Lee. Sonia, where are you standing? There she is. Who has uh, coordinated, activated, and implemented this wonderful gathering of all of you. And we are all most grateful to David's family, his wife Sherry, Forrester, and children Sophia and Gabrielle. I haven't met either one. Sophie, where are you? Hi. Gabrielle, where are you? Oh, right there, getting ready to play this instrument. For joining us today, as well as his stepdaughter, Eva Orbuk, a Stanford graduate. I'm looking around. Where are you? Not here. Not here. Oh, wonderful. Um, a Stanford graduate who couldn't be here today. Sorry, I didn't read my own script. David's family has donated the rich selection of archival materials they helped to assemble for the display in this room, a small taste of the complete archive that will be available to all when processed. So there are two, sh two uh, cabinets there, and I think there's one or two over here. We are also grateful to those who are about to speak about David's life and works. Joining us tonight from near and far to share their insights into David's extraordinary life and the many friends present. David Harris will be missed, sorely so, by many. Thank you for coming. Now, let me just check to see who's next to occupy this podium. Neil Reichlein, where are you? There you are. Hi. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Hi, I'm Neil Reichlein. 
I'm going to start out with a recollection that David had when he wrote about when he went to his first anti-war demonstration. He listened to the various speakers and thought to himself that I could be up there speaking someday, but he didn't know what to say at that time. <clears throat> Years later, he knew. He described the moment one day when he sat down at his typewriter and wrote his draft board, board and said that he re was refusing to cooperate with the draft, that he would never carry a draft card again. He remembered putting a letter in his envelope and dropping, uh, going to the post office, walking to the post office and dropping it in the box and, and sending it off. It was a beautiful, breezy, sunshiny day. And he said he felt like he could fly home. He said it was the first time he felt like he was his own man. And that's the David I'd like to talk about today about. I met David Harris in 1966 at the National Student Association Congress. It was a meeting of student leaders from around the country, from various colleges. David was student body president at Stanford. I was editor in chief of the UCLA Daily Bruin, though I'm not sure I should mention that after last week's football game. <laughs> I had come from the Meredith March in Mississippi, and I, which I had assigned myself to cover for the Daily Bruin. The summer before, I was a civil rights worker in Georgia trying to register voters before the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The previous fall, David had been in Mississippi with SNCC's fall voter registration. I had heard of David before, particularly from a story that went out on the wire services about an incident that happened after he was elected student body president. Students from a Stanford fraternity grabbed him one night, held him down, and proceeded to shave all of his long hair off his head. The frat, which housed a large portion of the Stanford football team, began to laugh and insult him as the shaving began. They had expected David to beg and snivel, but he didn't. He just laid there and stared at them eye to eye through the whole thing. The attackers' apparently, uh, apparent assumption was that they would be hailed as heroes for the humiliation they had inflicted on the hippie in their midst. But the local papers reported that 90% of the student body interviewed expressed admiration for the way David handled the situation. Even the fraternity men themselves voiced doubts. Harris really showed a lot of class, one told the Stanford Daily. He made us feel sorry that we did it. The incident increased David's visibility. The David Harris presidency now had a slight heroic tinge. So at the NSA conference, I was really looking forward to meeting, meeting him. Watching the blue jean, work-shirted, wire-rimmed, spectacled, mustachioed, moccasin-wearing, again long-haired David, and his relatively scruffy crew of fellow activists from Stanford walk onto the floor of the Student Congress, which was full of suit and tie wearing uh, student body officers, was like watching a band of good guy cowboys walking down the dusty street of a western town to face off with the bad guys. He was cool, very cool. I knew I was gonna like him. David's room in one of the student dorms at the Congress became the focal point for a lot of late night discussion. Student leaders from campuses around the country would drop by. David and the Stanford group group bought a tape recorder uh, loaded with the loudly played music of Jefferson Airplane, Big Brother and the Holding Company, The Grateful Dead, and more, artists who kids in the rest of the country hadn't necessarily heard of yet. And of course, someone brought some of that smokable stuff that California was getting famous for already, and soon more kids came. That dorm room was the spot for a lot of these guys to take off their suits and ties, I mean jackets and ties, kick back, and talk into the night about the world we found ourselves in, in the mid-1960s. One thing we talked about was an event that defined our generation in many ways, the Vietnam War. The principal skirmish at the student conference was Congress was between David and Allard Lowenstein. Stokely Carmichael was scheduled to debate Lowenstein, but at the last minute backed out, and David was asked to take his place. The topic was str strategies for change. Lowenstein, a lawyer, was the first NSA president in 1951. He was a liberal activist. He was friends with Bobby Kennedy, Eugene McCarthy, and other luminaries of the Democratic Party. In 1968, he would become a congressman from New York. 
But in the early 60s, Lowenstein briefly ser served as dean of Stern Hall, then a men's dormitory at Stanford, where he met, befriended, and mentored undergraduate students, including David. The room was packed wall to wall for the debate. Allard said students were right to oppose the Vietnam War, but, urge people to, but to urge people to step outside of our system was irresponsible. Turning radical was not the way to get things done. David responded, what's at issue here is behavior and personal morality, not just political systems. As young people, we have to decide how we're going to act in the face of something that we all apparently agree is wrong. The system Allard is defending offers no recourse. It provides us only with the right to be drafted, not even to vote, and certainly not to make decisions. While we wait for the system to change, our, uh, change itself, we're forced to carry out the very crime we're trying to stop. Anything less than immediate resistance amounts to collaboration. Neither one of these gentlemen backed off. Allard said the war was a big mistake. David said it was the logical conclusion of the values holding national sway. Allard reminded people that he was no pacifist and had served as an enlisted man in the army. David said he wasn't sure if he was a pacifist or not, but he was sure no one had ever stopped a war by fighting in it. <laughs> Allard, Allard said the point was to be effective. David said the real point was effective for what? <laughs> Allard said that young people should find any deferment they can to stay out, but if they ended up being called, they should go. David said massive civil disobedience was the most honorable strategic option we had, and that he would personally refuse to carry a draft card or to be inducted. I remember that everyone was wrapped. People were thinking hard, minds were churning, and when it was over, there was a long, loud standing ovation. There were three resolutions at that Congress about the draft. The conservative resolution treated the draft as a necessary fact. The liberal resolution criticized conscription's unfairness, but only called for criticism. The radical caucus, headed by David, offered a resolution describing selective service and its functions as unconscionable, and committed the NSA to organizing widespread non-cooperation and civil disobedience among the stu student population. When the vote was called on the Congress floor, a coalition of conservative and liberals defeated the ra radical re resolution by one vote. Many times over the years, when we remembered this and talked about it, we wondered about what kind of an impact there would have been on the national scene if we had won that vote. It was 1966. We were 20 years old. Sorry. Not even able to vote. It became clear to David, even at that early time, that by carrying a draft card, even if we had student deferments, we were sh allowing a system of to exist that said we own you for any purpose that we see fit, and that with our acquiescence, without us, that without our acquiescence, without us carrying that card and joining the system of conscription, it didn't work. So, convinced of the same, I joined David in the draft resistance movement. I made a film called David Harris, Political Prisoner, to use as an organizing tool when David was in prison. I shot an interview with him at Struggle Mountain, where he lived, where he and Joan, pregnant with Gabe, lived. Uh, I shot Joan and David Shirtliff singing in a packed auditorium, then, and then shot David giving his last speech there before he went to prison. It was brilliant and memorable. Some of you, many of you I see were probably there. If you're like me, you still remember some of those words. Quote, how does one make a revolution of life how does one take the fact of now and go from there and make something that is not the now that we know and we all live in? I think the answer lies in the notion that we all vaguely understand with the word love. And later, the initial preface, preface of a revolution based on love has to be a simple one. A revolution is made by the people, and the people is not a majority of those lives. The people is not those lives that we consider to be worth saving or we consider to be worth existing, the people. The people is a singular, and the people is everybody. And no revolution will be made unless it presumes the value of everybody. And then further, 
We've been told throughout our lives in America that if you do A, B really happens. If you do war, you get peace. We've been doing A for a long time and I've never seen B peek around the corner. To get A, you have to do A. You don't get what you say, you don't get what you wish for, you don't get what you believe. You get what you do. To get peace, you have to do peace in the world. The film finished with the federal marshals arresting David and driving off, taking him to prison. And it closed with the freeze frame of a resist the draft bumper sticker that resistance activist Rain Burns had put on the bumper of the, or did you, did you have the car? Did you put it on, Joan? Rain did, okay. It was 1969. We were 23 years old. By that year, the Selective Service had to draft 10 young men to get one to show up. By the summer of 1971, when David got out of prison, the ground war in the Vietnam was joined by Nixon's air war. Bombers from the US car aircraft carriers and bases dropped 7.5 million tons of bombs on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. In all of World War II, the US dropped just over 2 million tons of bombs. I went with David and other resistors to the Navy town of San Diego, and with local activists there, we held a vote to keep the USS Constellation aircraft carrier from returning to Vietnam. We organized, leafleted the streets, the entry to the naval base, held picnics, made TV spots, Joan had a concert, and David spoke. We were out there every day, and we got nearly 56,000 people, mostly Navy personnel, to vote to keep the Connie home. It, was, it sailed, however, and continued this massive bombing, but resistance to the war at that point kept growing strongly. When the peace accords were signed in 1973, we were 27 years old. David was able to get into his writing career in earnest. That year, David had his first of many stories published by Rolling Stone magazine. That began more than a 40-year career as a national and international magazine journalist. He signed with the New York Times magazine as a contributing editor, which he did for 10 years. After that stint was done, he concentrated on writing books. He published 11 altogether, starting with Goliath, his memoir about the peace movement and his own draft trial, then 10 more incredible nonfiction books, finishing with My Country Tis of Thee, a collection of his magazine and short nonfiction work. I was honored all those years when he'd send me early drafts to read and I'd give him feedback, but I never needed to tell him much. He was such a brilliant writer. When David ran for Congress against Pete McCloskey in 1976, I made some TV spots for the campaign. That's also where I met David's girlfriend, Lacey Fosberg, who he married the next year. Lacey was beautiful and brilliant, and, and for the New York Times, she was the consummate reporter. When Norm and I, my lady Norma, visited, and Lacey asked what we were up to, if either one of us gave too simple an answer, she would sit us down and grill us until she had every detail. I loved it. Can you imagine if David and Le had beaten McCloskey and this couple had gone to Washington, what an effect it might have had on that town? on this country. Their union gave us their daughter, the beautiful and talented Sophie Harris, in 1983. David was devastated when he and Sophie lost Lacey to cancer. I was back in LA, but I tried to be there for him and checked in a lot. I was so and David trusted enough to mourn with if he needed, and he did. Years later, when I lost Norma after being together since high school, 42 years, David was there for me. I lucked out when I met another wonderful woman, Marilyn Phils, who's here today, 18 years later. <laughs> and David lucked out when he met Dr. Sherry Forrester, whose loving and caring attention brought David's spirit alive when they got together in 1993. They married in 2011. What a difference. What a difference she made in his life. When David was diagnosed with cancer, he called to tell me and to talk about it. I could tell that he was holding on to a lot of feelings. I said that crying was a good way to discharge that grief that he might be feeling. And if he needed to do that, I was okay with it. I offered my avail availability when he wanted to talk, and so we talked fairly regularly. Even more when the cancer ultimately spread and David was given six months to live. I flew up to see him. We talked deeply about death and dying, shared our experiences with death, with people we cared for who had died, and we both cried. Whew. Sorry. 
Afterward, when I was back in LA, David asked via a call from Sherry, and uh, that winner, uh, Dellenbach, who's here also, who had contact uh, info for all the, everyone in the resistance, and I organized a series of three Zooms with close resistance friends and allies. We did that. Each session was with 10 or 12 people. David told them that he was dying, that he was discontinuing treatment, that he didn't know how much longer he had. He told everyone that we in the resistance were right, that when the country needed someone to stand up for what the country was supposed to stand for, we stood up and no one could take that away from us. Everyone got a chance to express their feelings to David. The sessions were heartfelt and meaningful for everyone. David described the last few months as a long, slow glide. It was interrupted by Sophie's beautiful wedding, which was moved up so David could walk her down the aisle, which he did with absolute joy in his eyes. A week before he died, he called to tell me he was given a week to live. I said I loved him, and he said he loved me back, and we said goodbye like friends of 58 years. When David was in his last days, surrounded by his family, Sherry wrote me and said that things are peaceful and tender here. Thank you, Sherry and Gabe and Sophie and Eva for making it so. Thank you, David, my dear friend, for everything you gave to me and to so many others. Thank you. My Redwood Confession, Me and My Tree. I'm 71 years old, a fourth generation Californian. As my life winds down, one of the companions I am most grateful to have had happens to be a tree, odd as that may seem. It is not just any old tree, but a very particular species to be exact, Sequoia sempervirens, the coastal redwood the tallest of all, found only within 40 miles of the Pacific Ocean along the California coast, from south of Monterey Bay all the way north across the Oregon border, colonizing damp creases in the landscape, feeding off the winter rains that falls in sheets and the slabs of summer fog that make landfall every afternoon. It crowds the riverbanks of the Eel, the Navarro, the Russian, the Matol, the Mad, and the Smith Rivers, as well as all the lesser watercourses that drain into them. If left uncut and to its own devices, this tree will grow as tall as 370 feet, longer than a football field, and almost 30 feet thick. And with a natural lifespan well beyond a thousand years, a Sequoia Sempervirens is not even considered an adult, until it reaches the age of 400. Sempervirens are, by design, of course, far grander than that. When mature and well-stocked with 400-year-olds, redwood groves are typically canopied, casting the forest floor in perpetual shade and capturing an airy cathedral emptiness between the bottom and the top. That enormous space, with patches of light filtering through its ceiling and drifting earthward like leaves on a stream, explains why a visit to an old-growth redwood grove, even in a park, is often considered a spiritual experience of the first order. And I take no exception to that description. Hello, my name is Dr. Lerone Martin. I am the Martin Luther King Jr. Centennial Professor here at Stanford. And I am also the director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. We are in charge by Coretta Scott King to promote and preserve King's legacy and to edit and publish his papers. I didn't have the privilege that many of you had of knowing David. I've only been here at Stanford for a year and a half. But I know the tradition that helped to shape him. David, as many of you know, went down to Mississippi in the fall of 1964 to help with voter registration. 
And it is there that he said that his eyes were opened, that he learned how to see. Being a part of the civil rights movement, he said, forced him to see things he had never seen before, that he would never be able to unsee them. There, trying to help people register, people who looked like me. He was standing outside of a car, and two men approached him in a pickup truck. Both of them drew their guns, called him a inward lover, and told him to get out of town. All of this for helping, trying to help people to vote. He said this shaped him, and he came back here to Stanford, this boy of the year from Fresno. <laughs> came back, and as many of you know, became the president of the Associated Students of Stanford University. And as part of my privilege and job as running the King Papers Project, I thought about what his time as president must have been like and discovered the actual invitation when he was president that they sent to Martin Luther King Jr. to invite him to come speak at Stanford. I want to read a little bit of this invitation that the Associated Students of Stanford University under David's leadership sent to King. I can hear David's words and writing in this letter. On behalf of the Associated Students of Stanford University, we would like to extend to you an invitation to address the Stanford community during the current academic year. As morally concerned and politically active as any recent generation of students, Stanford students today strive to understand the significance of all that is happening. We are vitally concerned with the direction taken by the civil rights movement in the United States and the leadership asserted by you, Dr. King, and others within your lifetime. Your leadership and your vocabulary have defined the goals and tactics of the civil rights movement and the peace movement during this decade. Your example has given personal commitment a fuller and deeper meaning. And you see in David's life this commitment in his activism, this full commitment, this deep commitment. And it shaped him and it helped to shape America. This is a tradition that we have to continue today. And while things have changed, we live in different historical times, the question that David posed still rings true today and is still relevant. And that question is, what is wrong with my country? David left us some lessons from his experience in the anti-war movement. And I think they're important lessons because that's what history and tradition gives to us. It doesn't always give us the answers for our problems, but it does leave us with lessons and values. And I'd like to share with you what David said about what lessons he learned from his anti-war protest. He said, quote, for those looking for an answer today, here are some lessons I have learned. We are responsible for what our country does. Doing nothing is picking a side. We are never powerless. Under the worst of circumstances, we control our own behavior. We are never isolated. We have a constituency of friends and family who watch us. This is where politics begins, with our friends and family. Reality, he said, is made by what we do, not what we talk about. I think I want to say that again. Reality is made by what we do, not what we talk about. Values that are not embodied in behavior do not exist. This is my favorite one. People can change if we provide them with the opportunity to do so. Movements thrive by engaging all comers, not by calling people names, not by breaking windows, and not by making threats. Whatever the risk, we cannot lose by standing up for what is right, for this is what allows us to be the people we want to be. You can hear the vocabulary. You can hear the commitment of Martin King and the broader civil rights movement and David's voice and his writing. 
And this is the tradition that helped to shape him. As we remember him today, we remember the tradition that shaped him. And if we are going to honor him, we honor the tradition that shaped him, we will embrace it, and we'll pass it on to those who come after us. Thank you. Our war. It was indeed all about heart. When we needed ours, we could not find it and could not care enough to stop ourselves, could not value all we were about to lose. And unable to value it, we could not save it when the time came. I remember. We lost so much more than any of us ever imagined we would. We lost the legend of ourselves. We lost our heroism and our nobility. We lost all perspective. We lost the string bean kid third row left in the third grade photo. We lost the toes off a thousand feet. We lost the place we once called home. We also lost the allegiance of each of us to the other, the communion at the core of our national self. We lost our right to pretend we were much different from the people we had once so routinely dismissed as venal tin horns and vicious thugs. We lost our innocence, our standing, our reputation, our faith in who we were, our dignity, the easy feeling when we looked at ourselves in the mirror. We lost the kid from down the block, the kid from across town, the kid from up the valley, the kid from over the creek, the kid from down by the bay, from up the state, from along the river, from downtown, from uptown, from the other side of the tracks, and from the very end of the road. We lost in the long run, in the short run, and in every run in between. We lost coming and going, on this side and that. We lost the fantasies I once chased home after watching Roy Rogers down at the Tower Theater and the illusions we all nurtured in the bowels of the chain of command. We lost much blood and more than a few tears. We lost legs from Dayton, spleens from Rochester, lungs from Boise, and kneecaps from Duluth. We lost billions and billions of dollars and we lost more sleep than we can remember, more joy than we can forget. We lost faith in our government, faith in each other, faith that anything was what it seemed. We lost our bearings. We lost our discipline. We lost our expectations of ourselves. We lost hope. We lost sight. We lost touch. We lost our good sense, our good name, and most every other good we had. We lost the knack for looking each other in the eye. We lost our clean conscience, and we lost track of who we were and who we weren't. We lost our capacity to tell real from unreal and true from false. We lost control, and we never got it back. I'm Sophie. I'm David's daughter. Uh, my dad and I spent the last year or two of his life in his office organizing what would become the 108 boxes of his work that now live here at Stanford. It's an honor to have a father that did such things with his life that these boxes are considered worth keeping by anyone other than us. I am eternally thankful, and so is my dad that Stanford will shepherd these items and make them available to the public. A deep thank you to Ben and Josh and Sonia and others who made this possible. Um, what's in the archive? It's letters, drafts, research, journals, speeches, photos, interviews with him, interviews with sources, footage, it's from his resistance work, his civil rights work, from while he was in prison, from journalism projects on six continents, from political work from our family, 
from elementary school to his deathbed. It's archives from iterations of his story and iterations of this country <coughs> and iterations of our collective relationship to media and the news. Beyond a political activist, he was a journalist for almost 50 years, and that's the accomplishment that I want to talk about. He was a researcher, artist, storyteller who tried things and kept things and made connections and asked questions and kept digging and iterated consistently for many decades. This career kicked off in the early 70s as a convicted felon and a single father without a college degree. He tried his hand at journalism because writing seemed like the only skill he had to sell. With no formal training, he leveraged his name recognition into a one-time chance to prove himself. That chance was a piece on Vietnam vet Ron Kovic that he delivered to Rolling Stone, and it worked. He landed a contributing editor role there, and that in turn led to many hard-fought years of work as a freelance writer. 11 published books, dozens of long-form articles, magazine cover pieces, fiction pieces, and that Ron Kovic story was, decades later, later, selected as one of Rolling Stone's 25 best of pieces for their anthology. Understanding the breadth of his work as we packed it up and labeled it was overwhelming. From the Central Valley to the Middle East, from drug runners to lumberjacks, from football commissioners to refugees, the work and research and sources there is an incredibly varied and intimate lens of our world. Through the irresistible pull of genetics, I too have ended up working in the world of nonfiction storytelling. Thinking as a researcher, there is gold in these boxes to the right person. Thinking as a daughter, the best part of these boxes was the time we spent together organizing them. From that time and from my perspective, there are two things I wanted to share about where my dad found success and joy in his work. First, he knew how to listen. For someone as outspoken as he was in certain settings, he really knew when and where to shut up and suspend judgment. I remember when I was a kid, there was a bumper sticker that I really wanted to put on the family car, and um, this would be a way better story if I could remember the bumper sticker, but I can't. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure it was something, you know, pretentious and definitive about how the world should be. And he wouldn't let me put it on the car. And he explained that as a journalist, he had to arrive open because everything is a two way street. If there was someone who didn't want to talk to him, he would say, I'm going to write about you either way. At least if we talk to each other, you have a say in the matter. And he meant it, and often they would talk. To be able to hold both, an anti-war activist who courted veterans, raised by a Christian scientist, but married to a doctor, an avid pot smoker who spent a lot of time with DEA agents over the years. Um, a man whose first job was packing melons, who married a Manhattan debutante, a patriot who criticized, a politician who spent four months in solitary, an intellectual who loved football. He could talk and listen across an aisle. And I think this ethos of finding human in the other and listening to them is something our world desperately needs more of. And the second thing I walked away with is that not everything lands, and that's okay. In our time together in the office, I was most struck by how many boxes there are of unfinished, unpublished, never launched, unvalidated, unseen, unsold work there is. There's a piece on post-war South Vietnam, a piece on friend from prison, a dam in China, uh, the anonymous hackers, the prosecution of Angela Davis, OJ Simpson, the Enron scandal, Iraqi refugees, on and on. Researched pitches with good sources that no one deemed worthy. Life as a freelance journalist is one of constantly pitching your ideas and yourself, essentially arguing your own legitimacy. 
for each paycheck. I think anyone who has attempted to create such a unique path can relate that it's exhausting. And for my dad, navigating the prestigious and competitive worlds of publishing and politics, that persistent definition he carried of ex-con without a college degree both bolstered him at times and gnawed at him at others. And all the more reason that this group gathered in this room at this most prestigious of institutions would mean a lot to him. <clears throat> As a daughter, it made me sad to see how much work was unfinished how many no's he must have heard over the years. But as a fellow creative, I also found it deeply encouraging that permission, that it wasn't a failure, as he would say, it's just part of doing business. Of course, the moral of the story is that he kept going, he kept writing and he kept pitching and there are plenty of other ideas that took so many. Um, I took a lot of footage of my dad over the years, especially towards the, the end, um, as my own coping mechanism, my way of carving an emotional foothold in this situation. Um, so to close, I'm going to play just a short clip of audio. Um, it's nothing overly profound, especially in the scope of his oratory career. But hearing his musings in his voice, albeit a sick voice, um, I think it's better than hearing it from me. So this clip uh, is a few months before he died and I had just asked him if he felt haunted or embarrassed by that unfinished work. You know, I, I certainly had anxieties about all that along the way. And, uh, You know, it wasn't until I got near the end that I could, I learned how to appreciate what I'd been through. Um, there was always something more to do. There was always unfinished business. And, uh, um, there was always the worry that comes with that stuff. But, uh, Going forward, anyway, is what it's all about. This is what I set out to do when I left Fresno. And it was to get as much mileage on it as I could. And I feel like I've accumulated a lot of miles covered a lot of territory, but uh, the secret is caring about things, mm. you know, that, uh, and acting on that, at least it certainly has been for me. That's it. Um. Thank you, everybody, for being here. The last thing I want to say is that this next clip is um, excerpt is from his his book, uh, Shooting the Moon, about the American invasion of Panama, and he specifically requested that we play this one because he thought it was the best paragraph he ever wrote. <laughs> Shooting the Moon One of a kind, this story begins at its end, in the here and now of Miami, where the afternoon rain sizzles off the pavement and cruise ships dock for weekends on Biscayne Bay, flags limp, smothered in warmth on all but the very worst days, the air heavy with the breath of swamps long since paved over. 
Miami, jumping off place for America's hemispheric underbelly, where all directions point south. The evenings end with breakfast, and the fast lane runs bumper to bumper from the beach to the jungle and back. Miami, no holds barred, where if it weren't for under the table, there would be no table at all. Miami, nose open and packing heat, where $20 bills are moved around town by the suitcase full, and almost anything goes as far as it is able, and not much farther. Miami, where this story started and finished, and without which, of course, this would be no story at all. Hello, it's such a pleasure to see so many of old friends here. Thank you for being here. Uh, one of the friends who couldn't be here is another great writer, uh, Orville Schell. Uh, Orville had to be out of town, uh, and he wrote a tribute to David that he asked me to read before I give you my remarks. In memory of David Harris. Many writers, and I am one of them, who cut their journalistic teeth on the war in Indochina, deeply admired David Harris. What we admired most about his writing was the mixture, mixture of elegance, clear thinking, and fair-mindedness that he brought to America's discourse with itself. For him, writing was a critical part of being human, and his belief that the written word can help our nation become a better version of itself never wavered. What further distinguished David was his belief that words alone are never quite enough. For him, writing was only the first in a two-step process that served as a prelude to acting itself. But of course, what he wrote also served as an invitation for others to act. In this regard, he offered the rest of us a roadmap for how we too might embrace not just our urges to think and write, but also to act. To do so without indecorously encumbering our voices with so much didacticism, didacticism that we lost the ability to remain convincing. This was the tape tightrope David walked. He understood that when writing is used to hector others, it becomes denatured, turns into propaganda, and abjectly fails. Staying on this tightrope was his challenge and his genius. But because he was always self-questioning and never self-serving and wrote beautifully, he was able to beguile people into caring about the things that mattered to him. Such attributes are the essence of only the most talented of scribes, and David possessed them in abundance. Now his passing diminishes our already meager fund of the kind of sane but passionate public voices that have so often helped keep our great but often errant nation from running completely off the rails. So we are left to lament his death, not only as a human being and friend, but as a public good, a town crier who was wise, principled, and convincing, and always tried to keep his eyes on his moral compass. Those were Orville's words, and I think we could all agree. Now it's my turn. <laughs> David Harris was one of my dearest and oldest friends. I loved you, David. He was the most empathetic, loving, kindest, fearless, and angry man I have ever known. <laughs> Though David's anger was mainly reserved for injustice. The trajectory of his life was poetic, courageous, inspiring, and heroic. He liked lists. He worked his entire life to make the world a better place, but he was not preachy or condescending. David was too empathetic for that. His politics was not abstract, it was personal, expressed in his actions, writing, and even in his art. David was one of those rare public fi figures who left no space between his principles and his action. When he acted, he did so absent any succession of self-interest or self-aggrandizement. David always spoke for the welfare of others. While I first met David when he was launching his congressional campaign in 1976, like many people of our generation, like many young people of our generation, I had already been inspired by David and his brave stand against the Vietnam War and the draft. He motivated thousands of young men like me. David was my inspiration for pursuing a conscientious objector status. 
To my surprise, I got it and did not have to wrestle with the terrible dilemma that he faced of going to war or going to jail. You can imagine then how excited I was early in 1976 when I heard that David Harris, who had recently announced that he was running for Congress, was coming to the offices of my group at Stanford Research Institute to seek our support. I won't deny I was a bit starstruck and hero worshiping. David did not disappoint. From the moment he walked into our nondescript conference room, the room lit up, the vibe changed. You could see it in his eyes, hear it in his voice, feel it in his presence. Like so many others had seen, you knew this was someone special. When he invited me to be part of his campaign, I did not think twice about joining his movement as the head of issues. Together, we worked through the important political questions of our time, but David carried the message to the people. He was an amazing orator. I had the privilege of hearing him speak dozens of times during the campaign, of hearing the power of his rhetoric to move people, which I could see in the faces of the audiences. They were pained by the injustice he felt and communicated so profoundly. They were inspired by his vision and courage for what it took to right the wrongs in the world. By virtue of his experience, he was a profound moral standard bearer. David moved them to want to do something by joining the campaign. David debated his opponent, Pete McCloskey, the Republican incumbent, four times in debates that attracted national and even international attention for the unique quality of the political discourse. As the decades have passed, David lost none of his rhetorical fire and intelligent inspiration. His activism and his oratory have evolved together. Shortly after his cancer diagnosis in 2018, he gave one of his last political speeches for congressional candidate Josh Harder, trying to dislodge the Republican incumbent in the district near where David grew up. Kathleen and I were there. His speech moved me to tears once again. As David spoke for the farm workers, the women oppressed by the Taliban, the mothers of murdered school children, and of course, the Redwoods. I felt bad for Josh, who went on to win the election. He was good, but not in David's league. <laughs> David loved football and had a great sense of humor. He played on his high school football team, not in a glamour position like quarterback. He was in the trenches with the gutsy players on the offensive line. When he went to Stanford, he expected to play football only to discover, as he told me, that the quarterback had a bigger neck than his thighs, ending his career as a football player. He did go on to play basketball, swim, row, and even play handball against me, though I'm pretty sure he won every game. As an author and journalist, David was a great storyteller. Most of his writing was in one way or another political, but as I said, football, and especially the Niners, were another love and one we shared. His book, The NFL, is about business politics. It was no, no surprise that David had the privilege of writing the official biography of Bill Walsh, who shaped how the game is played today. But much to my delight, I recently read for the first time his 2010 essay about the Niners that appeared in a book about our good friend Michael Murphy, who's here, also a dedicated Niner fan. It was recently republished in my country, Tizavi, book shown in the picture here. Uh, it is the tale of how he and Michael, by mystical levitation, had either changed the trajectory of Joe Montana's pass or elevated Dwight Clark to assure the success of the catch, the play that changed the destiny of the Niners, one of the funniest things he ever wrote. Over decades, David and I watched many games together, along with Michael for a few of those, uh, including the last amazing season, especially the painful last game. It would have been tragic if they had won and gone on to win the Super Bowl and David missed it. He at least knew the Niners season was over and not just for him. <laughs> One final thought. David was a remarkable man and he had the great good fortune to love remarkable women who loved him back. And I've had the great pleasure of knowing Sherry, whom David loved with all his mind and heart and soul and she gave it equally back to him. For that, I am very grateful to you for what you gave my dear friend. And in the years since his cancer diagnosis, and especially in these last few months, you and David showed us all how to live and die with grace. Thank you.
I want to make sure everybody sees the photo of David in his football uniform and of Peter and David watching the election returns. So you'll have to imagine that this hair <laughs> belonged to that man. <laughs> but, um, so David and I were together for 30 years and the early days were pretty chaotic, but we were incredibly drawn to each other. And that got us through the bumpy times and made it possible for the very passionate and healing connection that we had to evolve. People are usually surprised when I tell them that David was very frequently silent. And he attributed to this to the fact that he came from a long line of silent men. He was a great listener, and we did talk about everything from world, world affairs to our deepest, deepest emotions. And as virtually everyone has said today, he knew that words needed to be backed up by actions which is why his speeches often included that statement. You are what you do, not what you say. And David absolutely embodied that as an organizer and an activist, as a friend and as my husband. He was a hero. And a role model all the way to the end of his life. After he was diagnosed with a stage four prostate cancer in December of 2018, and then an unrelated stage four lung cancer in July of 2019, he wrote a series of emails. And when I thought about what I would say today, I decided to read excerpts that are so expressive of who David was. December 2020, subject, David's cancer speeds up. Dear friends and family, the tumor board determined that the cancer in my lung, while still indolent, is on the move and the time has come for chemotherapy. It is hard not to feel like my feet have been taken out from under me. The good news that has characterized most of this year had nurtured a hope in me that somehow I had a stage four cancer that was not going to raise havoc, but obviously havoc approaches. I now gather myself for the next chapter I lean on your love and support, as always. David. He asked for a two-month reprieve before starting chemo because he was just finishing hormone blockers for the prostate cancer, and he hoped that he would regain some strength before he needed to start the next treatment. January 2021. I confess to struggling with patient fatigue and often falling short in my attempts to cope with my ongoing physical deterioration. I can no longer swim the way I'm used to, now barely mustering some 20% of my usual distance before I am completely out of breath. I miss being able to count on my body. I try to fill in those unfamiliar physical blank spots with the energy generated by my heart. Still, it's sometimes hard to find reasons to be happy while swimming upstream against all this illness and debilitation. So I concentrate on being happy for no reason. David. Then on the eve of starting chemotherapy, February 2021, subject, what lies ahead? 
This moment feels weightier than any I've yet encountered on my journey into cancer land. Thus far, your support by email and text and phone calls has made an enormous difference and it will never have made more, meant more than it will in the immediate weeks to come. Your strength becomes my strength. Your wisdom nourishes my wisdom. Your bravery makes me brave. Your love allows my love to flourish. I feel like I'm on the top rung of the diving board about to jump, feeling a little weak need, but I'm not facing the terror by myself, which generates a kind of magic unlike any other. Thank you, David. August, 2021. I must confess to have been on something of an emotional roller coaster. I frequently wrestle with the questions of who I am now and what I am supposed to be doing with myself besides coping with chemo. Immobility and isolation are temptations, but ultimately poisonous. I am blessed to have your support and blessed beyond that by the calm of my Buddhist practice. Persevere is still my watchword, the now still my best posture, and joy, despite my circumstance, the best medicine for what ails me. Love, David. In December of 2022, David had been on chemotherapy for almost two years. His scans were stable and the side effects had become unmanageable. And the doctors recommended discontinuing the chemotherapy. Three months later, he was hospitalized with shortness of breath and disease progression. And the next email was written about few weeks after his discharge. April 2022. My oncologist has expected offered treatment with a newly approved targeted therapy, one that might delay progression, but worsen my quality of life. It was easy for me and Sherry to agree that I want to focus on quality over quantity. No more chemo or other anti-cancer meds, just treatment to manage symptoms. My life expectancy is short, but that was the case when I was first diagnosed in July 2019. So I'm not going to obsess over numbers. Love to all of you, David. August 2022, not surprisingly, I have been spending a lot of my time contemplating my end, trying to learn something about the seemingly unknowable in my future. So far, I have reached two conclusions. One, death is a benign experience for which we are already hardwired. Two, there is no way to know when death will happen, but whenever it does, it's on time. Love to you all. David. January 16th, 2023. When I last wrote, it was August. Time seemed to have plateaued and I'd long since registered for the end of my life with hospice. Now that August has packed itself away in the short, dark afternoons of autumn and winter, my disease has resumed a gentle, but nonetheless abusive downslope, sapping my energy in small increments, further diminishing my physical skills, generating debilitation, but still little in the way of pain. I now sleep in a rented hospital bed, 
have a caregiver during the day, three afternoons a week when Sherry is out of the house and a caregiver available through the night to assist Sherry if I need to get out of bed. I use a walker getting around inside the house and a cane or wheelchair for the rare times when I'm outside the house. Sherry has made a life for us while I am losing my own. In the meantime, I wait, crouched on death's front porch, keeping an ongoing conversation with equanimity, on the lookout for the white light that I remember coded my mother as death approached, grateful is where the story began and grateful is where it is ending. Thank you, David. That email was written three weeks before he died. And about the same time, he woke from a remarkable dream. He was stacking wooden blocks and saw that he was constructing a pyramid that was still incomplete. And he knew that at that point in his life, he was building something rather than subtracting something. He knew that white light was emanating from him, propelling him from moment to moment as he thumbed through his spiritual Rolodex. And I understood his spiritual Rolodex to be an accounting of his life and actions. And I know that his message to all of us is to keep building. There's so much work that needs to be done. From both of us, thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriel, uh, David's son, and uh, you've heard some really wonderful, beautiful, moving speeches about my father and his life and his loved ones today, and um, I'm not going to give you another one. Um, I, in a moment, I'm going to play the flying saucer over here in front of the jacket that my dad gave me when he was writing with Bill Walsh. And uh, it's an instrument called the hand pan, which my father had an affinity for. And uh, I uh, played for him frequently when he was in his process of departure. Uh, he affectionately called it the man pan. <laughs> and um, so I'm not going to. I did feel it pertinent to just take the moment to say a few thank yous. And uh, thank you first off to Stanford for hosting this and being a vehicle for his evolution and momentum and platform for him to um, be able to reach the world in the powerful way that, that he did. And specifically, uh, Thanks to Ben and Sonia uh, for organizing and making this all happen. And uh, thank you to everybody who's here today, everybody who's come to uh, honor his spirit and um, bring your own presence here. Uh, we all have seen him through a unique, our own unique lens and I've yet to speak with anybody that uh, has had anything negative to say about what they've seen and moreover have time and time again heard how he brought light into their lives. 
and um, something I'm grateful for and something that doesn't surprise me at all. And thank you uh, to Sherry for bringing light and joy into his life and for your um, unwavering care and support to him. It, uh, you know, he had a beautiful passing that couldn't have happened if he didn't have the kind of love and support that you gave him 24 seven. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for Sophie for your tireless work in, in uh, gathering his things into the archive. And, um, but much more importantly, thank you for being a beautiful, wonderful sister and always having loving, supportive words to say. And I'm so grateful for you in this life. And uh, last but not least, uh, thank you, Dad, David Victor Harris, um, for your clear and enduring love and uh, the light that you brought to so many people in this world and the courage that you showed the deep footprints in the sand that you left for many to follow. And uh, um, thank you for your sense of humor, often tinged with sarcasm that <laughs> runs in the family to the mixed reviews of many of my friends. <laughs> and um, thank you for your wise words, Dad, and thank you for listening and thank you for growing our relationship up to the very end. And uh, thank you for showing many of us how to live and showing some of us how to die because he really did it beautifully and gracefully. Um, not long ago, I was in a meditation retreat and um, on several occasions in these circumstances, I've seen my father and and uh, uh, which is always wonderful. Uh, sometimes it's been humorous the way he's shown up and, and it's always been filled with emotion. And on this particular time, um, um, a month or two ago, uh, I saw him there and, and uh, felt the sadness of his absence in the physical world and asked him, have you made it through the Bardo yet? And uh, a voice came back quite clear and, and distinct and said, yes, I am love. And in that moment, I couldn't see his face anymore. And I didn't try to because I figured that he was becoming one with everything. And uh, I didn't need to draw him back into what was his physical form. And um, so um, he asked me to play uh, uh, a piece uh, today, which I adapted to the hand pan and, and all play another piece that I composed just to fill things out and and, uh, and dad I know you're listening um, not because you're out there somewhere but because you're out there everywhere and um, so thank you again everybody for being here today <laughs> <laughs>